This morning, I'll be reading uh, the scripture, and it's the familiar account, Luke's account of the Christmas event, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I've entitled the message this morning, Home for Christmas. I've given this message a number of years ago because I think it's very, very important to deal with this theme. Most of us, when we celebrate Christmas, have memories that take us back to our childhood. And the truth of the matter is, so much of our memories, so many of our traditions really do go back to our childhood. It's interesting that we come from all of these different nations, and we come from a diverse set of theological backgrounds, church backgrounds. Everybody celebrating Christmas a little differently. I want to take, take you back to what my tradition looked like in the United States. We, Christmas memories go back to family gatherings, especially Christmas Eve, but also Christmas Day. And especially on Christmas Eve, it had to do with a special meal. (laughs) Turkey, with all of the trimmings. It's interesting that when we were in Estonia, our Estonian friends used to say, we just don't understand the Americans' fascination for turkey. (laughs) We don't even like the meat. And sure enough, you couldn't find it anywhere in the early years that we were there. But if you're an American... Turkey and the trimmings. You always had a Christmas tree. Hopefully you had a real Christmas tree. I never did like the plastic versions. But nevertheless, the the significance is make it colorful, make it beautiful, and place lots of gifts underneath that tree. And then if you're from West Michigan like I was, you almost always were assured of a lot of snow. So we had this memory of going out and building a big snowman. That on Christmas Day or close to it. Memories, even though it had very little to do with the meaning of Christmas, they're there. But no Christmas was complete without the reading of the Christmas story that I just read to you from the pulpit. Now, No Christmas is complete without 
the opening of the gifts. And let's face it, when you are a child, that's the most important thing that's going to happen at Christmas, is getting those gifts, and you've been, you've been watching them mount for days, and now you can tear into them and leave the wrapping all over the place. All of these memories of Christmas. And in the early years, way back, I remember at my grandmother's house, there were always carolers that came to the door and sang these beautiful Christmas carols. A beautiful memory, less and less true in later years. Those are all memories associated with Christmas. It's such an important theme that in the middle of World War II in 1943, Bing Crosby wrote this famous song, I'll be home for Christmas. And of course, it was deeply meaningful because it was written at a time when the men were fighting a war in Europe or in the South Pacific. And hardly anybody was home for Christmas. And my, my dad has a memory that when he was serving in the army during the Korean War, he wasn't home for Christmas. And he, he remembers going to the theater and watching this and crying because he wasn't home for Christmas. All of that by way of introduction. We want to be home for Christmas. How many of you have seen a number of Christmas films that are in our NEC library? Not many of you. I'm telling you, there's some really good ones. If, if you're into the whole Christmas season and you enjoy movies, and I'll tell you what, they're a little bit, what, how do our kids say it, Beth? Cheesy? They're a bit cheesy. But if you like that kind of movie, check them out. Some of them, they're not that good. Some of them are very good. But I'll tell you this. Consider this. The unusual circumstances of the actual Christmas. When Jesus came into the world. We read, in those days, Caesar Augustus, the emperor, the Roman emperor, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, why did he do that? Because it was time to tax the people. And every 14 years, the Romans would decide to send out that decree and send everybody back to their ancestral home to make sure nobody left, got left out of the census so that everybody could be taxed. That's what was happening. Verse 2 is like a footnote in history. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, friends, I don't know anything about Quirinius, but Roman Syria happened to be one of the provinces, and it's a footnote. It's a way of saying, You're, this is when it happened. Okay? What's, what's significant for our purposes? Imagine this. The timing of Jesus' birth and the place where he was born was determined because of an administrative decree by a Roman emperor. That's significant. And I want you to realize the inconvenience of it. Because you see, Joseph and Mary, their ancestral home, they, 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 they're under the tribe of Judah and they come from the line of David. So their ancestral home is Bethlehem where King David was born and raised close to Jerusalem. But that's nowhere near their home because they're living up in Nazareth in Galilee. And friends, we're talking a long way away, okay? And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Joseph went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. This is not convenient timing. How many times do we think, Lord, this is not convenient timing? I mean, I've thought about that this month. This is the heaviest time of the year for pastors, 
And we have to think about packing up and going. I don't have time to think about packing up and going. We're we're just too much in, in this season, and it's a heavy time. So I guess it'll have to wait until January. But the point is, for Joseph and Mary, this is anything but convenient. Take a look at this map. Galilee is way up there at the top of modern-day Israel. And Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. And if you follow the, the red, that is the path. By the way, why, why don't you go straight through? How come you don't go right down like that? Anybody know? Samaritans, you don't want to get anywhere near those dirty Samaritans. That's the thinking. Plus, by the way, they weren't really dirty Samaritans. But from a Jewish perspective, they were the people that were compromised. They were the people that the various empires that it occupied brought in from the outside. And they weren't necessarily faithful to their faith. And so they were despised. So the point is, avoid them. Except one time when Jesus said, we're going to go straight through the heart of Samaria. And he ministered to a Samaritan woman. And the whole town came to faith in Jesus. A beautiful story. But generally, you follow the long trek around, and it's more than 80 miles. Now, 80 miles or about 130 kilometers doesn't seem like much in our day. With our, but we're, we're talking about the donkey, a pregnant woman. It took a long time. It, took, it was a hard journey. It was anything but convenient. And yet the Scriptures tell us, but when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman. I, I like the King James Version that says, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. You see, friends, God's time is, is somehow always right, even if it doesn't feel right or convenient to us. The second amazing thing is, is this. Not only, not only was an inconvenient timing causing Joseph and Mary to leave their home and have to go somewhere else to their relatives, but it was also a situation where Jesus himself left his home. Because really, he was in heaven. Remember, Jesus' life didn't begin as a baby. He was with God before that. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Remember, friends, Jesus came from the Father in heaven. He left his home in order to do something so important. And that's why when Paul reminds us, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or hung on to or clinging to but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Again, I want us to reflect on the huge step down that Jesus made in order to leave the glory of heaven, to step down as a vulnerable human being, to come as a baby. All for a purpose, because he's on a rescue mission. God sent him. Now, when we get to the actual account of the birthing, uh, once again, 
not very convenient. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them. I have this, there was no room for them in the inn because most of us grew up with the King James Version or translations that followed the King James Version because the King James Version happens to have a very bad translation of one word that gets translated in in the King James Version. And so we develop this nativity scene, imagination, where Jesus is born in a, in a barn or a stall with the animals or in a cave. I mean, how many of us always think that? We do, because that's what gets reinforced every time we see a nativity scene. By the way, isn't the nativity scene out there beautiful? It is. Now, that's partly true, but it's not partly true, and I want us to clarify that. Because there's a scholar a number of years ago, Dr. Kenneth Bailey, who happened to be living in the Middle East for, I believe, a whole generation. And he says, when you live in the Middle East you kind of understand the Palestinian setting. Because, and, and, and as somebody that, that spent 13 years in Estonia, we understand it too. Because the homes in Estonia, the old traditional farmhouses, have the stall attached to the house. You did that to preserve heat. It was a practical issue. These were peasants. Now, there's two words in the Greek, pandokian and kataluma. And, the, and a pandokian is a public inn. And it's interesting that there's three passages in the Gospel of Luke that use pandokian and kataluma. Kataluma is a guest room. Okay, so let's go to the passage, Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man who was injured uh, and nearly left for dead on his own donkey, took him to a Pandokian, an inn, and took care of him. It's a public inn. That's what you picture? That's correct. Now, there's another place in Luke that uses kataluma, and it's the Last Supper. Jesus is sharing his last meal with his disciples. In Luke twenty two eleven, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the kataluma, the guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? The kataluma is the guest room. It's usually large enough to have a meal. That's where Jesus celebrated the Last Supper. So which word is it also in the Gospel of Luke? It's kataluma. Guest room. Now, I, I want you to... You, 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 if, you, if you looked at the NIV here, we're looking at the 2011 version of the NIV. The old NIV done in 1978, followed the King James Version because they just didn't have enough courage to go against all of those centuries of tradition with the nativity scene. But the scholars of, eight, of seven, eight years ago, they said, let's, let's make this correction. Let's just do this right. And they changed it. And so now... It's an excellent correction. We have right here, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Actually, if you really do your homework in the Greek, it's because there was no room for them in the guest room. Why wasn't there room in the guest room? Because not only Joseph and Mary needed to go home, but all of the relatives needed to go to their ancestral home, so they went to the home of a relative. In Bethlehem. And there's so many of them there that there's no room to place 
Jesus in the guest room because it's overloaded. So instead, they're in the living room, which is attached at the edge to the stall where the animals are. So I want you to picture this. This is a typical village home in Palestine around the time of Jesus. And these still exist if you go there, if you look. So what, what happens is, is it's, it's about four feet above. The living room and the kataluma or guest room are about four feet above where the animals are down here. Okay, can you picture that? That's because they don't want the animals going into the living room. But it's often an open area. And then at the foot of the flooring for the living room, that's where you'd place the manger or the feeding trough for the animals. Makes sense, doesn't it? So the farmer during the winter time, he doesn't he he has the animals there, you preserve heat. Remember these it's a peasant home. And you simply would lay the hay and place the child in the feeding trough. It's logical because that way all of the relatives could enjoy seeing the newborn baby. So it picture this. It's not quite like we thought with a cave or a barn, but it sort of is true because you still have the, the manger. The animals are watching the son of the living God. The relatives are there who love Mary and Joseph and are probably celebrating the birth of this child. And it really is a beautiful scene when you recreate it. If you can just sort of get the other thing out of your mind. And, and, and it is hard for me. I mean, how many times did we do that nativity scene in church school where you, you, where you knock, knock, knock. They're, sorry, there's no room for them in the public inn, like a hotel, right? No room. So you'll have to put up with the stall. Sorry, folks. If you've always thought that, get it out of your mind, okay? Because I, I for one, believe in biblical accuracy far above traditions of sentimentality. Okay? And the other thing is, the Magi didn't come the same night either. Sorry. <laughs> they just didn't. But um, in any case, na nativity traditions are what they are. So, recreating this revised scenario, what's the significance of this? This is, this is where we're going. Jesus left the glory of heaven in order to come down to us. Because where's our real home, friends? Where's our real home? Where ultimately is our home? It's in heaven. It's in heaven with God. By the way, here's another picture. See this. You've got the living room. You've got the Lord animal stall in the Cataluma. I didn't make this up. You can pull this right off the, the web. Okay? So, just another version of the Cataluma, the guest room. No room for them in the guest room, so they're all in the living room enjoying Jesus. Not quite like that. But our citizenship, friends, is in heaven. Our citizenship ultimately is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, God sent him down to us so that through Jesus, we could go back to God, to our real home. I think that's the significance. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, Jesus said. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to do what? To prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. God is preparing a home. 
for you and me in heaven. It's very, very exciting. You know, every I was very, very touched a generation ago when I was a pastor in uh, Hopkins, Michigan. And, and I read this article. So this is a generation ago, more than 25 years ago, about a mother's search for her estranged son. The woman's name was Beverly Elliott, and she's from Houston, Texas. She had not seen her son Russell Love for four years. She hadn't even heard from him in over two years. All she knew is the last she heard is he was jobless and he was homeless. And she knew that he had made some bad decisions and felt shame. And so he wouldn't come home. But she yearned for him to come home. And she decided to reach out. So she calls the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and she calls the Los Angeles police, and she says, can you help me find my son? Sorry, ma'am, we don't do that. We, we really can't help you. So she got creative, and she thought, I'll put an ad in the L.A. Times, the most read paper in Los Angeles, California. And she did it for 12 straight days, and she prayed. Lord, help him to see it. Or Lord, help somebody that knows him to see it and get his attention. And somebody did. One of his homeless friends saw the newspaper. And he called up the newspaper himself and said, I know him and I know right where he is. So they sent a reporter to him and they showed him the ad, the ad read like this, Russell Love from Houston or anyone knowing where he lives, please call his mother collect at the number. Collect means she'll pay for it. Just call. See, in in those days, you used to have to say, calling collect from, and then they can say, we refuse the call. (laughs) Or we'll accept the call means we'll pay for it. The other end. Call, collect. Russell, your mother will never forget you. She loves you. That's it. So the newspaper reporter goes up to Russell, to this homeless 27-year-old man laying on a blanket similar to this picture, and says, did you know that your mother is asking for you? She wants you to call home. And... You know, are you Russell Love? Yes, I'm Russell Love. Are you from Houston? Yes, I'm from Houston. Please read this. He reads the article. Now, he is so full of shame, he's reluctant to call. But finally, he decides, can she really accept me? Can she really forgive me for the choices I've made? He decides to take a risk, and he calls, and she cries. And she says, I'm so happy that you called. I want you to come home for Christmas. I'm going to send you money, and I'm going to send you plane tickets. Just come home, which he did. He went home that year for Christmas. And there's a follow-up article which shows the two of them embracing and hugging and Russell saying, it feels good to be home this Christmas. Now, friends, that story is a little bit like our story as followers of Jesus. Because Christmas is really about being contacted from our home way far away by somebody who loves us enough to send somebody to us to make a way so that we can end up being in heaven With God, our Heavenly Father. Is it not? And when we look at the revised, more biblical understanding of the nativity scene, the actual nativity scene, it's about being with family. It's about 
Yes, not being home in our comfort zone, but being with those that we love. And we've been contacted from beyond. God reaches down from heaven and says, I love you. I want you. And I've provided the way for you. Just come home. And friends, Jesus is the way. He's the way. That's why Jesus is the reason for this season. It's like God saying, come home to your real home, which will always be your home. Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's table, we are reminded why Jesus came. On a rescue mission for us, so that we could ultimately enjoy home forever with God, our Heavenly Father, in eternity. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we will be with you and with the Lord Jesus and with all of our family and relatives who have died, who, have been, who are in Jesus and who are now with you. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we will truly be home because you loved us enough to send Jesus into our world and to provide the way back to you. We give you thanks and praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.